but thank you all for being here. My name is Paige and I'm uh, representing Flows to Bay today and I'll be your moderator. And on behalf of Flows to Bay and our presenter, IPM advocate Charlotte Kanner, I'd like to extend a hearty welcome to everyone who's joining us. We're really glad and excited that you're here with us this morning. So a little bit about Flows to Bay, if you don't already know uh, what we are. <laughs> um, so we are um, hosting this today. Uh, Flows to Bay is a short term that we're using for a longer term, just because it's um, at least a little easier to remember for folks, but our actual name of our program is the San Mateo Countywide Water Pollution Prevention Program. And uh, it was established to reduce and prevent pollution carried by stormwater into local creeks, our bay, and ocean. And we really encourage residents to reduce their pesticide usage and opt for less toxic options when working in your garden or dealing with pests. And that's really why this topic today for this webinar is really important to us, because there's a lot of less toxic practices that you could implement that aren't harming our waterways. And there's actually a lot of things that we may be doing that we don't know have an effect on our waterways. So that's why we love this topic and that's why we're here today to discuss it. Okay, and the program aims to educate the community and do what we can to prevent stormwater pollution. And so we really work with residents, businesses and schools and really get the word out about watershed protection and all the actions that we could do to help our watersheds. So what's a watershed? It sounds like a very big word, but it's actually really important. And it's the land that water flows over or through um, on its way to a body of water, like a creek, our San Francisco Bay, or our Pacific Ocean. And we know San Mateo County is really unique in the way that we have so many bodies of water and so many different types of bodies of water around us. So it's kind of like a funnel. So that water is traveling across the land and it carries whatever is with it to those nearby waterways. Um, and I'll go into why that's really important, but we all live in a watershed. Every part of this land is a watershed. And so everything that happens to that watershed, the, the water flows over to those local water bodies and then that could affect the water quality. And that affects, you know, there's animals living in the water and um, it could be fish and birds and other living things that really depend on that water to be healthy. And also us humans may, may be in those bodies of water. And so whatever quality of water um, is the, like the health of it could really affect our health as well. So storm drains, uh, we really care a lot about the health of our storm drains a lot. And if you don't know already, San Mateo County has a separate sewer and storm drain system. So this means that, again, anything that flows over our land and then flows into um, the nearby storm drain goes directly into our water bodies untreated. So there's no like filtration or cleaning process. It's just whatever maybe flows over your lawn will like go to the sidewalk and then goes into the storm drain. And there's not that process that cleans it. But internal plumbing inside our homes enters the sewer system and gets piped through a wastewater treatment plant. And that is the water that does get treated and cleaned. And there are municipalities that have a combined drainage system like our neighbors in San Francisco. Uh, but again, San Mateo County, we have these separate systems and most municipalities go through that way as well. So this means that any of the water that we use to maybe irrigate our lawns or for like our sprinkler systems and also all the wonderful water that we have coming uh, from rain that travels around our hard surfaces and then it picks up whatever um, it comes across along the way and then that just goes directly into our storm drain and then goes through our creeks and the San Francisco Bay and Ocean and again it doesn't have that cleaning process that a sewer system does so that means um, certain uh, things that are carried by that water can become stormwater pollution. And that's where we're really concerned about and the different actions that we can do to prevent that. So different types of stormwater pollution include pet waste, automobile fluids, and emissions. And other sources of pollution could be litter on the ground, chemicals um, used in soaps for car washing, 
and pesticides and fertilizer. So things that you are treating your plants with really can get carried with the water as well. And as we know, all these pollutants will eventually end up in our waterways. So that's why we're here today, because there's so many ways um, to have less toxic alternatives um, for the various actions you do in your garden, on your lawn, and all the other ways that you kind of may make certain choices, but those choices could be really good choices. And it's all learning experience. And I'm, I've learned so much from Charlotte, and that's why I'm really excited she's here today, because I'm excited about what I can do in my garden for the spring and knowing all the ways I can really prevent stormwater pollution. So with that, I want to introduce Charlotte. Uh, she is an integrated pest management advocate in association with Our Water, Our World. So Charlotte, take it away. Thank you, Paige. Uh, thanks for that great introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I also wanna say happy first day of spring. Um, what a wonderful thing to do on our first day of spring, talk about preparing our gardens, because I'm sure you're all very anxious to get your hands dirty. Um, and it looks like a beautiful day today, so hopefully later y'all get to <laughs> practice some of what we talk about today. Um, so as Paige said, I am an integrated pest management advocate. Um, I work in partnership with Flows to Bay and the Our Water, Our World program in San Mateo County. And I also work in several other counties in the Bay Area. Um, I'm also a compost instructor and a compost uh, enthusiast and advocate. So you might hear some of that enthusiasm come out in the presentation as well. Um, so what we're going to learn today is what integrated pest management is and how we can apply it in our gardens and our homes. Um, why working with an IPM approach is going to automatically lead to less pests. We're going to cover some spring gardening tips. And at the end, we will talk about some aphids, uh, some, some seasonal uh, uh, pest issues like aphids, weeds, and some fungal diseases. Um, I'm going to talk for about an hour. There will be um, a couple breaks here and there for a poll, um, some polls and questions. Um, and then, of course, at the end, we'll open it up to just general Q&A. So first, a little bit about our water, our world. Um, it's a program designed to, to design to Sorry, excuse me. I'm just going to warm up here. Um, it's a program designed to bring awareness uh, between pesticides and water quality, something that Paige already touched on. Um, and we're going to, we also provide pest problem solving education. You can find our water materials in over 200 hardware st stores and nurseries in 23 counties in California. And in these stores, what you'll see is the fact sheet that's um, the photo on the left those, um, that rack of fact sheets about, about 18 different kinds of uh, pests or just general issues like lawns and roses, which are of course free for you to take. And you can also find all those fact sheets online at ourwaterourworld.org. We also, you might see in some stores, shelf talkers, these little blue tags underneath certain products that highlight the eco-friendly products on the shelves. You can also, on the website, you can also see the stores that our Water our World partners with and a list of less toxic products as well. And in San Mateo County, we partner with 10 stores, including four Home Depots. Great. So for those of you who know what integrated pest management is, it's going to be a little bit of a review, especially if you've attended one of our my uh, the webinars that I've hosted before with Flows to Bay. Um, this will be some... Um, bit of a review for you. And for those who don't know, welcome. Um, so integrated pest management, it's a decision-making process. It's um, a process that allows us to look at the garden or the home more holistically as a whole, as opposed to just focusing on the pest. So it asks a lot of questions too. Um, we have to figure out what really is the problem because a lot of times we'll see um, something, a symptom like leaf damage, and we're gonna, we need to know what's going on there. There's a lot of different things that could happen. So really we need to identify the problem. So first, what is uh, the problem at hand? Is it um, an abiotic disorder, which is something like 
irregular fertilizing or irregular watering problems, or is it a pest? And then what is the pest? We really need to identify what we're actually targeting. We're going to then decide, can we live with it? Um, maybe we can let some things, um, you know, some things are short lived. So maybe we, and they're just a nuisance. So we can just let them be and then let them, let them go. We don't have to take any actions. But if there are pests that are causing a lot of damage, we might want to take some actions. And what we're going to take um, in IPM, they're called controls. Um, so we have four different kinds of controls. Cultural controls are really about bolstering the health of the garden. And we're gonna to touch on what that means a little bit later. Mechanical controls um, are the physical tools and barriers that we can use in the garden. Biological controls are inviting in the beneficial insects and really creating balance in our gardens. And then chemical controls um, are pesticides and they're always a last resort um, in IPM. We're gonna exhaust all of the other options. And then if we really need to resort to chemical control, we're gonna choose the least toxic as possible and use as little as possible. Here's another image to demonstrate what is IPM. Um, now you'll see that prevention is listed as number three, though I do put prevention as first, the first step in IPM because there's a lot of things, it's really the foundation um, of IPM, and there's a lot of things we can do in the garden and in our homes before pests even arrive that will just eliminate all the hassle of pests um, and will prevent them from even coming or causing problems in our garden. Um, and then once they do arrive, we're gonna identify them. Again, identification is key. We're gonna evaluate the damage, decide if we need to take action, and then our action steps, as I said, cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical. And then of course, we need to monitor at the end. Um, after we've taken some actions, we have to go back and see, did what we do, what we did, um, did it, did it, did the popula population decline, did it work, or do we need to try something else? So first we'll talk about prevention. Um, now prevention, again, I said is the foundation of IPM and it's really key because um, a healthy balanced environment and healthy plants are going to attract fewer pests and be able to fight off pest issues. So um, much like a, uh, think preventative me medicine. So when we're practicing preventative medicine, eating right, exercising, doing all the things to keep our bodies healthy, we're automatically less uh, susceptible to sickness and disease. So what does prevention look like? It can look like a lot of different things. Um, we can implement tools as a way of prevention. So this could be when we're in the gardens this spring and we're putting in new plants, we're going to put our plants in gopher baskets because the Bay Area is um, everywhere in the Bay Area, there's gopher problems. If you don't have gopher problems, I shocked <laughs> to be honest. So, um, and the best way to deal with gopher problems is with prevention and exclusion. So we're gonna put all of our plants in gopher baskets, even if we don't necessarily have gophers yet or they're not causing big problems, smart to do it anyway. Timing of the man management action is really important. Uh, we're gonna touch on this a little bit later as well, but uh, right now before, it, um, before summer arrives, we wanna actually put our yellow jacket traps out uh, now to see if we can catch the queen. Um, because if we catch the queen early, um, she comes out early in the season and then um, goes away. So if we catch her, that will really decrease the yellow jacket population. So understanding that the importance of that timing. Correct water and fertilizing management. This is um, really key because inadequate watering, either too much or too little, will stress out the plant and will invite pest problems. So prevention in this case could be setting up um, an irrigation system, um, either drip or otherwise, to really um, encourage consistent watering and appropriate watering for the garden. And then good sanitation. Um, that's really key inside and outside in the garden. So inside the homes, we're um, just keeping our kitchens clean. We're not free feeding the pets. That will eliminate any possibility of pantry moths or rat, rodents or ants coming in or wanting to come in. And um, in the gardens, we're gonna be cleaning up 
uh, maybe pruning out any damaged branches from the winter, uh, that will reduce any, um, reduce the threat of some fungal diseases. And then proper identification. So as I said, proper identification is key in IPM. If we don't know what we're looking at, we can't treat the problem. Um, so uh, it's really easy to misidentify pests and I'm gonna give you some tools on how to, that will help you identify. But we really wanna know, is it a good bug or a bad bug? Because we have to remember that 90% of the bugs we see in the garden are actually good bug, beneficial bugs. Um, for example, this caterpillar on the screen is a black swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. It looks very similar to another green striped caterpillar called the tomato hornworm, which can cause major damage to tomato plants. So we really wanna make sure we are identifying those properly. Um, understanding life cycles is also very important um, because again, as I said, life, some life cycles can be very short term. So we um, might be able to just withstand their, um, their life cycle and then let them just be and they won't cause too much damage. Um, we wanna understand pest habitat and timing. So for example, um, like when are plant pests going to show up? For example, coddling moths are emerging now, um, adult coddling moths. So we're going to put traps out to make sure to monitor for them. And then if we do see evidence of coddling moths, we're going to really inspect our fruit. And this is specifically for apples and pears because that's where they cause the most damage. And then we also want to understand the natural enemies of any pests. And if they're present, we wanna make sure we're not using any pesticides and we really wanna nurture them as well. So for identifying pests in the garden, here are some um, resources for you. The Our Water, Our World website has all of those fact sheets that I mentioned that have um, images of many common pests. And then the UC IPM website is um, a huge wealth of knowledge and I highly recommend digging into that website. I use it regularly. Um, they have what is a kind of compared to a WebMD symptom tracker that you can use to identify if you have something going on with your plant and you don't really know what it is. Um, you can use clues like where is the damage, what kind of damage, what kind of plant is it, um, to, and all these other clues to, to narrow down the possibilities of what it could be. Because again, yellowing leaves could be a fertilizer problem, a water problem, or it could be a fungal disease or even an insect problem. So we really need to figure out what we're dealing with. So I highly recommend that um, website as well. And you'll get these resources at the end. Um, Paige will send them out as well. So no need to write them down. All right, so we covered prevention, which is the foundation and we covered identification as well. So we're gonna move into our action steps. And this pyramid, I just wanted to share with you because it really shows the progression of how we take our actions in IPM. So we start with prevention as a foundation, and then we're gonna to move to control, uh, cultural controls, excuse me. And cultural controls is really similar um, to prevention. It's just bolstering the health of the garden and doing a lot of things that we do anyway um, that will prevent pest problems because healthy gardens, healthy plants will lead to less pest problems. And cultural controls, just to elaborate a little, also more about changing the environment so that your plants, um, changing the environment for your plants to be very successful and so that the pests will be less successful. And we'll talk about those methods. So first thing I would recommend, as I said, I love compost. So add compost, use compost in your garden. Um, it has so many wonderful benefits. Um, it improves the soil structure. It, uh, so if you have sandy soil, you can add compost to your soil to really glue those big sandy particles together. If you have clay soil, you can add compost to really break the particles up and allow for better water in infiltration. Improving your soil structure will lead to more uh, water holding capacity. Um, compost can hold five times its weight in water. So this is really important when we're thinking about the warmer months coming, we really wanna add compost and increase our water holding capacity, absorb that moisture that's in the soil now from the winter months um, and really keep it there. 
Compost also increases the health of the soil and the plants. It inoculates the soil with really good bacteria and fungi, which we absolutely need in our soil. And it adds nutrients for those organisms to eat and to feed your plants. Um, I did just learn that uh, when you're planting, which I know a lot of you are intending to do soon, it's actually a good idea to add compost to your soil about two weeks before you start planting. Um, I think this is just to build up the soil organisms in the soil and really get your soil prepared for those plants. And as I said, um, bacteria and fungi are key in the garden. Um, your plants cannot survive if your soil is not living. And so you, we add compost to increase the life in the soil. And we really wanna nurture that life in the soil. Um, again, your plants need these soil organisms to live. It's just like your, your gut microbiome. So think about all the bacteria that lives in your stomach and it, you can't digest food without that bacteria. It's exactly the same in the soil. Your, the soil organisms are breaking down the nutrients from the fertilizer and the compost, and they're feeding it to the plants um, uh, when the plant wants it, which is really important. So we're gonna nurture that bacteria and fungi by adding compost, using organic fertilizers, and not using pesticides because pesticides can kill um, that good bacteria and fungi. And we wanna to switch to organic fertilizers or use organic fertilizers, maybe not switching. But um, so synthetic fertilizers, tend to be very high in salts. So over time, using those can increase the sodium levels or the salt levels in your soil, which will lead to less water holding ability and just lessen your plant's ability to uptake water. Um, synthetics also um, act kind of like steroids or Red Bull, <laughs> I like to say, for your plants. They inject your plants with a lot of energy uh, really quickly. So your plant grows really fast, but it's not a stable, steady kind of growth. It's fast and then there's kind of, you know, a sugar crash. Um, they're stressed out. They're not really prepared for that kind of growth. Um, so what we want to do is we want to switch to an organic fertilizer. Organics usually say organic on the on the bag, or they have an OMRI label that you can see it on the all-purpose box right there, O-M-R-I. OMRI is a good sign that it's gonna be um, certified organic. And what organic fertilizers do is that they still, they feed your plant, they help your plant grow, but they're gonna help your plant grow at the speed that it is ready to and, is, and it wants to grow. So um, the difference I like to explain is that organic fertilizers actually are feeding the soil and the soil organisms. And like I said, they're gonna feed the soil organisms and the soil organisms are gonna feed your plant at the rate that your plant wants it. Whereas synthetic fertilizers feed the plant in more of like an injection kind of force feeding kind of way. Another reason to use organics is that they're not gonna run off into local waterways. When synthetics build up in waterways, it can cause problems like algae blooms and very toxic environments. Um, and they also have also, you can't, it's really difficult to over fertilize with organic fertilizers because again, you're really feeding the soil and not the plants. Whereas you can over fertilize your plants with synthetics. And then mulch. Mulch is another cultural control that we're gonna use in the garden. It's just a beautiful way to increase the health of the garden. It protects the soil. Oh, and I just wanted to say that when I'm referring to mulch, mulch is really anything covering the soil and it can be made of lots of different things. It can be made of rubber, oyster shells, cardboard, straw. Um, when I'm, but I think I recommend using organic mulches like wood chips, bark, straw. Those kind of mulches will just provide you the most benefits. There are some benefits to the others, but overall you're gonna get the most benefits from using um, like a bark or a wood chip. Um, so mulch protects the soil. It's like a nice blanket layer for your soil, which keeps water in, it prevents evaporation. It keeps the soil cool in the summer, which is gonna be important. You really want those roots to have uh, more of a, a moderate temperature instead of the 
cold in the winter, warm in the hot in the summer. We really want to moderate the temperature of the soil. Um, it also, as these organic mulches break down, they feed the soil organisms. Um, it can be used as a weed control as well because that nice thick layer of mulch on top is going to prevent the weeds from germinating. It creates habitat for beneficial insects like ladybugs. And again, it, as that protective layer, it's going to reduce soil compaction and erosion. So it'll keep the um, soil in place and it'll allow water to infiltrate really well. One note, if you do get like a big um, sh sh uh, delivery of mulch this spring, uh, you do and you don't use it in one <clears throat> day, you want to tarp your mulch piles to really keep the mulch from blowing off onto the street and again getting into the sewers. We don't want them getting into the storm drains on the street. Um, like Paige said, is all that debris will build up and we don't want, we want to keep that out of the, the waterways. Now, cultural controls also include just choosing the right plant. Right plant, right place. It's a, for one of the first things I learned in gardening. Um, your plant is not gonna be healthy if it's just unhappy, if it's not suited to the place that it is planted. So we have a really unique climate in the Bay Area. Um, we have a Mediterranean climate where we have our wetter winters and our dry, hotter summers. So we really want to choose California natives or Mediterranean plants that are adapted to that climate. Um, we're gonna study our yards, figure out what our yard microclimate is. And even if there are little microclimates within the yard, you can have a slope, you can have a shady area, you can have a low lying area that gets more moisture. Uh, you wanna really be conscious of the different areas um, of your yard before you just stick plants wherever. You wanna match those plants the conditions of the yard. Um, because again, if they're going to be happy in that spot, they're going to be automatically more healthy, they're going to be less stressed and less susceptible to pests. And there's also lots of pest and disease resistant varieties, you can always ask your local nurseries about those. And to review just more things to consider when you're picking out your plants, you're going to study your garden's microclimates, how much space do you have? Remember that plants get bigger, hopefully, um, after you plant them. And so you really want to make sure that you're giving them enough space to grow in, um, in the space that you put them in. Um, what is the topography? Is it sloping? Uh, you really want to be aware of that when you are planting. And how do you intend to use the space? Uh, again, if you plant a tree right in the middle of the yard, it's hopefully going to get bigger and it might, um, you know, get in the way of some other thing that you wanted to do in the yard as well. Also, another thing that we forget to ask ourselves when we're planting these big, beautiful gardens, um, who's maintaining the garden? That's something to remember. You are going to intend on doing it yourself. Maybe you want to start small, depending on, you know, how much time and energy you have. Um, but if you're going to hire a crew, maybe you can go big. Just something to keep in mind when you are at the nursery. And then remember, um, every plant at the nursery has a little tag that comes with it that will talk about the sun uh, needs, the water needs. It might even talk about if it likes sandy or clay soil. Um, those are all things to keep in mind when you're buying. And then to further help you in your plant choices, here's a few plant lists that I'm also going to supply for you after, um, after the presentation, so you don't need to write down the links. But the Basqua plant list has um, lists broken down by categories. You can find lawn substitutes, ground cover, uh, pollinator plants. Uh, the Yerba Buena California Native Plant Society has um, native plants. And then the UC Arboretum All-Stars has a nice searchable database so you can really find out um, you know, trees or shrubs or whatever you're really looking for that will be suitable for your area. And then lastly, in the cultural controls, we're also thinking about water. Um, so water, uh, improper watering leads to stressed plants and that leads to pest issues. So we really want to make sure we're watering properly. And the best way to water is deeply and infrequently. So um, we're not watering our plants a little bit every day. That will lead to shallow roots um, and quick evaporation. We really want to give our plants deep watering, especially if they're new. 
um, that when, when they're getting established, they really need that deep watering to draw those roots down deep into the soil to really establish a sturdy, hardy plant. And for most plants, we want to make sure that the top of the soil dries out between watering. So the top inch, inch I'd say one to three inches, depending on the size of the plant, um, should dry out between waterings because we don't want them sitting in water as well. And related to what we were talking about before, studying the microclimates of your yard, you also want to plant your plants together that have the same needs. So especially your water needs. So you're going to put your, your lawn and your heavy water need um, plants together. Maybe you'll put your succulents and your more dry tolerant uh, plants together as well. And then think about, again, sun, shade, wind, heat, all of these things contribute to microclimates and what your plants need. And if you're interested, um, a really wonderful way to offer your garden consistent, uh, regular water is to set up an irrigation system. And they don't need to be drip irrigation systems, but drip irrigation systems will be the most efficient method um, of watering. So the drip lines have little emitters on them. They sit directly on the soil. And so the water goes just directly into the soil. We're not spraying around. Um, the water isn't flying around <laughs> like um, with a sprinkler. Uh, so the water is just going directly into the soil. That will lead to uh, better water efficiency, also less weeds because the water isn't going where you don't want it to go. It's just going directly to those plants that you want it to go to. And you can set the timer for early in the morning to water when the air and soil are cooler. Also, you can set it for multiple times. So um, depending on the soil type you have, you might need to water uh, maybe three times for a shorter amount of time in one morning chunk. Um, remembering that drip irrigation systems are not set it and forget it. So right now for spring, you might have changed your irrigation to either turned it off or um, eliminated some of the waterings for the winter time. But right now we're gonna wanna maybe as it gets, there's more sunlight, it gets warmer, we might want to increase our waterings again. Um, again, checking though, you wanna check between waterings to make sure that the water, the soil is drying out. And we're also checking, especially if you're turning it back on after the winter season, check your system for leaks, um, make sure all the emitters are working properly and they're not spraying all over the place. And so as we're preparing for our warmer months, we're gonna take some time now to, um, to prepare for water-wise gardening in the summer. Uh, so preparing now will help you um, with your water efficiency. You can add mulch, again, mulch, compost, all these things are gonna help you have a water-wise garden. Um, installing a drip irrigation or any kind of irrigation system, really whatever works for you. We're going to remember to water deeply and frequently, and we're really gonna focus the water at the drip line of the plants, trees, and shrubs. So I didn't mention that earlier, but we really want, we're not watering at the base of the plant ever. We're, we're watering, um, it's called the crown where the, the upper the above ground parts and the below ground parts meet it's called the crown we never want to water at that point because that invites rot and fungus so we're going to focus the water at the drip line which is the outer edge of the branches so think if it rains that's where like the rain's going to drip off uh, we really don't focus water out there so that the roots can go down and out and really um have a create a sturdier base for your trees and shrubs and then um, you can i think flows to bay has some information on any rebates that san mateo offers on either high efficiency irrigation systems or removing lawns and um, i'll have Paige you know chat any information out if she has it all right so we're going to talk a little bit about some seasonal maintenance and then we're going to talk about more of our control options not quite as lengthy as their cultural controls, but we'll touch on all of them as well. So I'm sure you're all anxious to hear about preparing the garden for spring. And there's a few things you can do in the garden. 
now to help prepare. So again, we're adding our compost and organic fertilizer to the soil. Excuse me. Um, ahead of time to prepare the soil and really get the, the soil organisms, um, the populations up and really get them active in the soil um, and increase our water holding capacity. We're gonna add mulch to the soil. We're gonna adjust our irrigation for longer days. So that might be increasing the frequency of waterings, um, especially if you decrease them over the winter. <clears throat> We're gonna prune. Um, so check your any trees and shrubs for any frost or just general damage from over the winter. And now um, if the frost risk is gone, which is soon, it's still getting a little cold at night, but um, check your forecast. If it looks like the frost risk is over, then it's time to prune your citrus trees. You can also start your edibles um, inside or outside, depending. Um, and in this area, in the Bay Area, now you could probably start your, your cabbage, beets, ca uh, carrots, um, peas and, and, and beans, and then potatoes, radish, Swiss chard. Those are some of the um, veggies that we can start planting now. I would check, I would recommend checking the local Master Gardener website. I actually was looking at it yesterday. They have a really great chart for um, what to plant both inside and outside seeds or transplants. Um, and depending on if you live in a, a sunnier or a foggier area of San Mateo, it's tricky with these, these Bay Area counties, there's different microclimates just within the county. Um, so I would recommend looking at that calendar because that will give you more specific planting schedule. And if you have a lawn, actually, I would recommend if you've had issues in the past with lawn grubs, now is actually a time to consider applying beneficial nematodes, which will, um, which are a bio, a biological control to controlling grubs in the gar in the lawn. That will also controlling grubs also leads to less raccoon problems if you have sod or a lawn. Um, so it could be wise for anyone who's also had raccoon problems. And then also we're planting perennials to attract um, our good bugs, our beneficials, and we'll touch on a little bit more of that later. So we're gonna talk quickly about our mechanical controls. Our, these are our physical tools and barriers that we can use in the garden. Um, we're gonna continue um, keeping our home safe and, and free of rodents, ants, and other flying insects. So we're adding screens to our windows because we're probably gonna wanna keep the windows open pretty soon. So keep the screens on or add the screens, keep flying insects out. Where um, if we're having rodent problems, we're continuing to figure out where they're coming in. We're adding hardware cloth, quarter inch hardware cloth to keep mice and small rod rats out. Um, reminder that mice and small rats can fit through a hole the size of a pencil, three eighths of an inch. So we're gonna use quarter inch hardware cloth to seal up any cracks. We're gonna add weather stripping and caulk to our doors and windows to keep ants and other crawling insects out as well. And in the garden, we're gonna work with barriers. Um, we're gonna add row cover to our freshly planted kale and cabbage to prevent our cabbage moth butterfly or cabbage moth from landing and laying eggs and um, keeping those cabbage moth caterpillars out of our brassicas because they are voracious and they're, I don't know, I, I hate them. They're, they eat all my plants. So I'm pro row cover in this situation. Um, make sure that you inspect your plants before you put the row cover on to make sure that there's not already eggs or caterpillars on the plants. Um, and then we could use bird netting to keep the birds off of our fruit trees. It's a great time to use the bird netting now um, when the trees are still a little smaller and the fruit's not ready yet. So get it on now. That should also keep some squirrels out. Again, we're using gopher baskets. If you live in a deer prone area, you could put up an eight foot deer fence. And then you could also use copper tape to keep snails and slugs out as well. And that little strawberry basket is just an example of another barrier. Um, the bottom two photos on the right are just simple barriers that can protect your plants from rodents and birds throughout the summer as well. 
And then traps, that's another form of mechanical controls. We're using sticky insect traps, fly and yellow jacket traps. Remember, put your yellow jacket traps out now to hopefully catch the queen. And then if you catch her, that will mean that the yellow jacket population will decrease um, in a lot. Uh, we're going to use consider gopher traps. If you do have gopher problems, they're a little tricky, but um, they are effective. If you have more rodent, rodent problems, rat and mouse traps, and you can also create snail and slug traps as well. These are all non-toxic pest management um, options for you. And then moving on to our biological controls, we're going to bring in the beneficials and we're going to focus on the three Ps our pollinators, our predators, and our parasitic insects. So our pollinators are like bees and butterflies. We want them in our gardens to pollinate flowers so that we can have fruit. We can't really have tomatoes or eggplants or, or yummy fruits like that or um, apples and other tree fruits if we don't have our pollinators. We need our predators. These are like spiders, ladybugs, um, lace wings. These eat the bad pest insects that we want to get rid of. So they're, talk, they're doing our pest management for us. And then the parasitic insects, like parasitic wasps, are tiny little wasps. They're not like yellow jackets. They're, they're small or tiny. They lay eggs on caterpillars. Um, and then when the eggs hatch, the larva eats the caterpillars from the inside out. It's kind of gross, but hey, they're doing the pest management for us. And that's what we want. Um, and remembering 90% of the bugs in the garden are good bugs. Um, and bad bugs tend to be seasonal, whereas good bugs are generally um, around all year long. So we really want to nurture those good bugs and create a habitat that they will thrive in. And I'll just note that on the top right corner, there's the 10 most wanted bugs in your garden. That's a brochure that you can find online at the Our Water, Our World website that we'll talk about. 10 bugs that we want in our garden and how to attract them and what they're gonna do for us. So to create an environment um, that's good for our beneficial bugs and other critters, we're gonna create biodiversity. We're gonna plant lots of different plants because the more plants we have, the more variety of insects will come in. Um, we're gonna plant plants with small clusters of flowers like yarrow, alyssum, buckwheat, and ceanothus or um, plants like daisies or sunflowers with that ray of petals around a button in the middle. Um, beneficial insects bo like both of those types of flowers, like the little clusters or the, the daisies. Um, we can use chunky mulch, like chunky bark that creates a shelter for uh, ladybugs and other beneficial insects. And we are going to avoid pesticides because if we know we want, good bugs in our garden, or we know that there are good bugs in our garden, we are not gonna spray any pesticides, including eco-friendlies, because that can always lead to unintentional kill. And it is possible also to buy some good bugs, like ladybugs and lace wings at nurseries. Um, that is an option if you do have certain problems, certain pest issues, and you wanna bring them in. Um, but keep in mind that if you don't have an environment that they like, they're gonna sit, for example, ladybugs, they'll come in, they'll eat whatever they're supposed to eat. And then once the food is gone, they're out of there. So you, it's best to invite them in by providing a um, habitat for them. Also, if you do want to help them, I've learned that you can spray like a mixture of like a sugar water mix on some flowers that will really attract them as well. Um, and then birds. Birds are also another form of biological control. 90% of bu birds eat bugs at some point in their life. Um, so we wanna nurture them in the garden as well. Um, though I would avoid bird feeders for several reasons. Um, bird feeders in general tend to attract a big mess and um, rodent issues, squirrel issues. Um, right now, I don't know if my, you might have heard, there's an actual um, a salmonella outbreak um, amongst birds uh, that's killing um, a type of finch, a songbird. So right now, I would say absolutely no bird feeders. Take them down immediately, empty the bird baths, clean the bird feeders with bleach, um, and then keep them out of the gardens for a couple of um, a couple more weeks. I think in a few weeks. 
uh, the finches will have migrated more north, so we can um, put the bird feeders out again if you want, but again, I don't recommend it. Um, really what we're doing is we're actually helping birds socially distance, ironically, um, so we don't want birds to congregate in bird baths or bird feeders right now. So um, take those down. Um, and then also in, in normal times, we want to let our um, plants go to seed because birds like to eat those seeds and they'll use that uh, dead material for their nests as well. And then more about biological controls. They're not just um, bugs and birds. It's really about an understanding that all critters in the garden create balance. Um, and so we wanna be conscious of uh, the other other things that, you know, the snakes, the lizards, the owls, the bats, the hawks, the coyotes even, we, not that we wanna invite coyotes into our yards, but understanding that all of those critters um, have a place in the ecosystem and they create balance. Um, so we just want to be aware of that when we're working in our gardens. And lastly, we'll talk about uh, chemical controls. So again, they're always a last resort. That's why we're talking about them last. And uh, uh, we're going to try to use all of those other options that we talked about before we resort to our chemical controls. And so again, it's, we're, we're understanding our target. We really want to know what we're targeting before we start spraying for a few reesons. Um, uh, Eco-friendly pesticides tend to have a narrower spectrum. So they only target a certain type of pest. And that's what we want because we don't want that accidental secondary kill of another um, critter. So we really wanna choose a narrow spectrum eco-friendlies. Uh, for example, there's a caterpillar killer type um, spray that's made of a bacteria that only kills caterpillars. So if we know we have caterpillars that are causing problems, we can just choose that. And then there's less of a risk of killing, um, you know, the ladybugs or any other bees. Um, and then uh, we're going to read the label. The label is the law. I can't, I'm going to say it again. The label is the law. So you have to read the label. If the pest that you're trying to target is not on that label, then you cannot use that pesticide. And you have to read the label to learn about the proper applications because uh, it might just be a spray bottle, but some plants, some pests require slightly different applications and you really need to read the directions before you proceed. Again, it's against the law to use pesticides improperly, even eco-friendly ones. We're going to always wear our PPE, our personal protective equipment, um, eye covering, mask, gloves, long pants, long sleeves. Um, even eco-friendly products are designed to kill something, so therefore they could cause irritation. Um, eye, lung, nose, um, uh, skin irritation, all of those are risks even with eco-friendlies. Um, and we're going to take advantage of the dormant season. It's a little late for that right now. We could talk about that in the fall, um, but the, thinking about certain pest problems you might have now, so if you have aphids, scale, peach leaf curl right now, next November, you might want to consider looking into dormant spraying because it's the, only, it's the one time we're going to use pesticides as a preventative and we can tackle some of those fungal and insect diseases during the dormant season before they even arrive. Um, and um, on that note, if you do have peach leaf curl, on your peaches or nectarines right now. Unfortunately, it's too late. So uh, it's too late to do anything except to remove the leaves, but don't worry, your, your fruit trees should be okay. Um, but consider dormant spraying next time. So dormant spraying is good because in the, dorm, in the winter months, the, the beneficial insects are less active. And some more tips for using our products. We're going to remember that less toxic products might take a little bit longer, so be patient. For example, when you, you use an ant bait station versus a spray, um, the bait stations do need a few days to work, but they are overall going to be more effective than a spray. 
Um, we're going to understand timing. So again, read those labels because the labels, you can see that um, bottle has a nice label there. They, they usually come with a nice little booklet of information. Read it. Um, it'll help you understand when the best time to apply the pesticide is. We're going to spot treat only. We're only spraying where the pest is. The pest has to be present to spray. Um, the one exception is the dormant spraying, but we're not, we'll talk about that later uh, in November. And um, we're going to apply pesticides later in the day. So we're going to wait till the winds, the afternoon winds have died down. Um, the beneficial insects are less active in the evening. So we're going to wait till then to spray. And that will also give, um, with eco friendlies, that gives the product time overnight to dry on the plant because as it dries in about 12 to 24 hours, it will be less toxic to um, any beneficials. And again, if you're releasing beneficials like ladybugs into the garden, you wanna make sure you're not spraying uh, any pesticides before or after they arrive. And um, related to what Paige was talking about at the beginning, we wanna make sure we're not um, putting anything down the storm drains and the sewers on our street. Also, um, to add on to what she was saying, we're never dumping pesticides down the drain in our, in our homes. Pesticides are actually not removed from water at water treatment facilities. Uh, pesticides are very persistent in water and they're just very difficult to remove. So when you dump them down the drain, they might go to the treatment plant, but they can't be removed. That is synthetic for uh, pesticides. Um, so we're always taking our products to the household hazardous waste collection facility. We're never dumping them down the drain. And the um, website is there for you to make an appointment. I think because of COVID, they're doing appointment only, um, but there are lots of appointments available um, and you can find where the locations at that website. All right, so now we're gonna look at some specific pests, um, aphids, weeds, and fungal diseases, um, how to deal with them if they arrive because this is the season. So aphids, this all, I will say in the Bay Area, because of our temperate climate, aphids tend to be an all year round problem, but you might have um, a bigger issue uh, in the spring um, because aphids are attracted to new plant growth. Um, so aphids come in a variety of species. Um, they come in many different colors. There's red, brown, gray, uh, green, yellow. Um, so don't, they could look wildly different. Some even have wings and some don't. Um, and different species like different plants. So you're gonna see, you might see aphids on um, you know, your tomato plant. Uh, but don't worry about the plant next to it. If it's a different, if it's a different kind of, uh, if it's not a tomato, if it's like a kale, there are going to be different aphids on that. So you don't necessarily need to worry about one species jumping to another plant, um, unless they're the same kind of plant. Um, they are attracted to new plant growth, and we're going to keep that in mind when we uh, do our controls. And then remember that ants protect aphids. So aphids excrete, excrete this uh, material called honeydew. Um, it's like a sticky sweet material. That's a good hint if you see that um, kind of, if your leaves are sticky, that's a usually good sign that aphids or some kind of sucking insect is on your plant. Ants like to harvest that honeydew. So ants will actually protect aphids from their natural predators, which are ladybugs, one of their many kinds, many predators, um, very commonly known ladybugs though. So we're gonna take all that information with us when we go to our controls. So because aphids are attracted to new growth, we again are not gonna use our synthetic fertilizers because when synthetic fertilizers are gonna cause our plants to shoot out a lot of new growth all at once. We're gonna use organic or slow release fertilizers. We're not gonna over prune, so be very careful when you're pruning. If you over prune, pruning um, encourages um, uh, plant growth. So if you over prune, again, you're gonna have a lot of new growth and a stressed out plant. We're gonna manage our ants, because again, they will protect the aphids from uh, their natural predators. So we're gonna use, um, say if you have aphids um, on a tree 
and that you can see ants crawling up the tree um, in a line, you're gonna take um, a material called either tangle foot or um, any kind of sticky insect glue. There's lots of, variety, lots of products out there. You're gonna wrap a piece of paper around the trunk and then we're gonna put the sticky glue on that piece of paper. We're not putting the glue ever on directly on top of on the tree trunk. A really simple and non-toxic way to manage aphids is to just spray the plant off with a strong stream of water. Um, again, uh, aphids are sucking insects, so their mouth parts are like straws. So when they're drinking from the plant, their mouth parts are kind of injected into the plant, either the stem or the leaves or wherever they're eating from. So when you spray them off with water, their body goes that way, but their mouth parts actually stay in the plant, so it kills them. It's kind of, people have compared it to kind of like a tick when you pull off a tick. Um, so you're gonna have to probably spray um, a lot or, or not a lot, but multiple times, uh, depending on the amount of aphids you have, um, but it will knock back the population a lot. You can also just prune off, completely just prune off really infected branches. So if you have one branch that just has a ton of aphids on it, just clip it, put it in a trash bag and, and throw it away. Um, we're also gonna, as I said, we're gonna invite ladybugs and other predators by creating um, a habitat that they like with diverse plants um, because more ladybugs will eat those aphids. It's also one thing to remember that a few aphids are actually good in the garden because they do provide food for ladybugs. So if you've completely eradicated the aphid population, um, however you do that, um, you're actually taking away ladybugs uh, food and other predators food, so they might leave your yard altogether. So again, that's, that's another way, what reason we evaluate damage. If, you know, a couple of aphids on your plant, they're not going to damage your plant too much. Maybe we can just tolerate them, hope that the aphids keep them, or the ladybugs keep the population in check. Um, and I didn't mention earlier, but aphids actually, they do cause some damage. They they'll cause like leaf stippling or leaf curl. Um, small to medium infestations don't really cause a ton of damage uh, to plants. It might slow the growth. It's really the large populations that you do need to be concerned about. Um, but again, it's not going to be caused like, it's not going to be devastating to your plant if it has some, a few aphids on it, um, especially if your plant's healthy. And then you can also, if you have tried all of those other things and you still have a pretty solid aphid population, you can consider um, insecticidal soaps or horticultural oils um, as a spray, um, remembering only spraying the, where the aphids are, um, spraying in the evening and being very, um, being very careful with how much you're spraying. And then, as I said, you can also consider dormant sprays in the winter time. If you do have aphid problems, say on your roses right now, um, like and any other deciduous plants that you have, uh, maybe consider spraying an all seasons oil um, on your plant in the winter time next season. Um, what that does is the spray oil will smother the eggs that are overwintering or the aphids that are overwintering in your plant um, and will uh, reduce the amount that hatch out in the spring. All right, weeds. So just want to remind everyone that a weed is just a plant growing in a place that you don't want it. So um, it could be, you know, some people love dandelions and oxalis, some people hate them. Um, a weed could also be, you know, a volunteer tomato plant that popped up in your strawberry patch because you used compost with tomato seeds in it. Um, in my yard, I actually have calla lilies that act like weeds. Gorgeous flowers, I didn't plant them. Uh, they just pop up in the winter. They could be considered weeds. I'll keep them around. I don't mind them too much, but if they get out of hand, I gotta, I gotta deal with it. Um, so again, that's just perspective for you. It's just a plant that's growing in a place you don't want it. Some weeds can be very invasive though, and they can overwhelm native plants and cause problems for um, wildlife and humans. So we do wanna be conscious of that. We don't wanna um, let them completely com overwhelm native uh, populations. 
it's really important when you're dealing with um, weeds, especially really tough ones, that you do understand how they grow and when they grow. It'll be more helpful for you when you're trying to remove them. Um, for example, I'm sure you all know that oxalis is a winter weed and it grows by um, a little, like a seed, a bulb in the soil. So if you're pulling the oxalis out, that's like the clover, um, you're gonna wanna make sure to get as many of those little bulbs out of the soil as possible. Also, when they first pop up in the fall, which is a little late now, um, getting them when they're really small will be key. So that's just, again, understanding timing of your, of your pest is really important for dealing with it. So some weeding solutions. Um, some cultural controls would be planting more plants. So the more plants that you want in the garden, the fewer plants, uh, fewer, less room, uh, these plants, weeds that you don't want in your garden will have to grow. So again, more plants, um, they will also shade out the, um, more plants will shade out areas where weeds can germinate. If you have weeds in your lawn, I recommend trying to cut your lawn a little bit higher, uh, leave it longer, and that will help shade out weed germination as well. Using mulch, that's a mechanical control when it comes to um, uh, weeds because it's really just a barrier between the soil, uh, the, the seed germination. Um, and so uh, thick, Thick mulch, again, um, if you have a large area of weeds that you wanna get rid of, that maybe you wanna plant in or you just don't wanna look at the weeds, use that uh, sheet mulching um, idea that I talked about earlier. Three or four layers of cardboard all overlapping over the area and then three to four inches of mulch on top. That's gonna keep some really tough weeds down. Um, I actually just did that in my yard last summer and I'm happy to say that most of that area does not have any oxalis in it, which is, makes me very happy. Um, hand pulling using tools and weed whackers. Um, I hate to say this because I know it's not what people want to hear, but hand pulling and using tools is actually the most efficient um, an effective way to deal with weeds. Uh, unfortunately, I know that people want a better answer, but you really do have to put in that physical effort to get rid of them. Now, a lot of weeds you can just hand pull, hand pulling them earlier in once they first pop up when they're very young is the best um, to let them not uh, develop too much of a root system or develop, go to seed because certain weeds um, spread through seed, some spread through rhizome under the ground. Again, that's why we want to know what we're dealing with. That also affects how we pull them. And if there are some really pernicious like perennial weeds that are just have a deep root system and you can't dig them up or pull them up, um, you can just cut them down to the crown. So as close to the soil surface as possible, um, cover that with mulch um, and then really just monitor it to make sure no little suckers come up and just prune those away immediately. That unfortunately is the best way to deal with weeds like that. Um, and then a really simple way to get rid of um, weeds and cracks, um, instead of spraying it with a little pesticide, you could just boil some water. It has to be boiling water, it has to be over 200 degrees um, and pour that into the cracks. That's a really um, a very safe way to just get rid of those weeds. You don't really wanna use it um, on a large area. It's just not efficient and we don't wanna kill all the life in the soil. So that's more for, for just cracks and edging. And then if you do want to try a pesticide, of course, there are some eco-friendlies out there, some made of clove oil and citric acid, ammonium no nanoate. <laughs> and there are a few other in active ingredients out there that are less toxic to our waterways um, that you can consider. If you want to learn about those, there's um, a weeds fact sheet on our waterourworld.org that you can, that will list some more products that you could use. All right, and then fungal diseases. So we're probably, we get a lot of fungal diseases now because um, we still have a lot of moisture in the air, temperatures are still cool. Um, so that's, that's what promotes a lot of fungus. Um, and fungal diseases can cause discoloration, distortion, and um, premature leaf drop. Again, a lot of 
fungal diseases, if they're kept with under control, they really just cause them like leaf drop and maybe slow the growth of the plant. They rarely kill the whole plant, although that's not true for everything, but um, the most common ones, if we're monitoring it, we can keep it under control. So fungal diseases like black spot and rust, and most others actually, like cooler to moderate temperatures, they like moisture and they spread via splashing water. So the water will carry their, their spores. Um, but it is important to note that actually powdery mildew is the one fungal disease that's a little different. It actually likes dry conditions and um, slightly warmer, like moderate temperatures, and it likes shade. So this is something to consider when we're dealing with um, one or the other or both. So um, for fungal disease solutions, um, the best thing to do would be when you are planting is to ask for or look for disease resistant varieties because certain plants that are prone to fungal diseases have developed disease resistant varieties, especially um, roses are a, a, a big one as well, a big one for that. Um, water early in the day. Uh, we should be watering early in the morning anyway when the air is uh, cooler, but if you have a fungal problem on any plant, maybe water mid-morning. Um, this will allow the plant to really dry out before nightfall and before the temperatures get cool again. We're going to put mulch around our plants to, this will reduce splashing. So, um, if you're if you're overhead watering or you're watering like by hand, mulch will um, prevent like the, the splash back into the plant. Um, pruning, uh, pruning is really important for a few reasons. Pruning out any um, diseased leaves or branches or flowers um, will be really important. Um, and then it, pruning to increase airflow and light to the plant will um, decrease the chance of fungal diseases. If you do have um, uh, fungal issues, it could be it would be wise to consider drip irrigation or just watering the soil only. So even if you're watering with a watering can, really focus that water just on the soil, again, around the drip line of the plant, not at the crown, um, but just on the soil. We're not overhead watering. Um, because this will reduce the amount of water on our plant. Um, and we're again, we're removing any diseased foliage as soon as we see it. So just prune it out um, and don't put it in your compost pile, put it in the garbage. And then, as I said, um, powdery mildew actually likes dry conditions. So unfortunately, it makes it a little confusing. Um, for powdery mildew, you, for powdery mildew, you actually do want to um, use overhead watering on your plant, but that will could potentially increase other fungal diseases. So you kind of have to balance it in your head. Um, if you have powdery mildew though, uh, and you do, you can very carefully just wash off the leaves that have it, um, either wipe them with like a, a moist uh, towel or sponge, or just very carefully, it's called, I guess it's called syringing, but you would just like very carefully apply water to those uh, leaves. And then again, do this mid morning. So it allows your plant to dry out before the temperatures go down again to reduce other fungal diseases. And you could use, there are several products out there. You're gonna to wanna to use a fungicide, make sure uh, you're gonna use a fungicide because those kill fungus. Uh, you're not using an insecticide, um, on your fungus, it's not going to help. Um, so a copper soap or copper fungicide, neem oil, um, sulfur. Also, there's a, this would be considered a, a biological controls, actually using this um, a bacteria that specifically acts as a uh, fungicide. Um, I can't say it, but there is a, there is um, uh, products that have the, the bacteria that Monterey disease control um, spray that you can see on the bottom that uses that bacteria, um, which will only target fungus. And then also consider dormant sprays. So again, if you have powdery mildew now already or peach leaf curl, there's um, a great way to manage those in the spring is to apply dormant sprays in the dormant season. If you do continue to have questions in the future, you're welcome to contact Foes to Bay 
or you can contact me um, directly via email or Instagram.